Hello everyone, it's Mike coming at you from a very sunny day in Seattle and in just about two weeks I'm teaching a course on headaches, how to treat them, how to assess them, and I thought it might be fun to share a few of my thoughts with you here. So, if you experience headaches or treat people with headaches, you know it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. The good news is that many things help. If you can touch someone safely and innocuously in this part of the body, chances are you will be helpful with the headache. But not always, and not always for a sustained period of time. And therein lies the rub. Headaches are not simple behaviors. They don't respond to simple protocols. And oftentimes, what we want is to help someone deal with a pattern of headaches over time, not just an immediate irritation. So how do we break down the phenomenon of a headache in a way that we can work with it both in the moment and also over time? Here are my thoughts. First of all, let's think of headaches as an irritation of the trigeminal system. I'll get to what I mean by that in just a moment. But for a moment, let's talk about pain. For the purposes of this video, let us define pain in this way. Pain is a protective behavior of the nervous system. It is an output of your nervous system that emerges into conscious experience in response to a perception of threat. It's not the only behavior that your nervous system engages in when it perceives threat. There are others, for example, changes in muscle tone, changes in autonomic behavior, changes in inflammatory behavior. The reason I mention this is because oftentimes we see the co-occurrence of these factors as maybe causing each other. For example, we say tension headaches and we think muscle tone is causing pain. That's probably erroneous. Probably the best way to think of it is muscle tone and pain are both outputs of a system at least one layer of which is perceiving threat, right? So then the key is how to identify which layers of the system are getting threatened and how to deal with that perception of threat. That's where it's helpful to think of the trigeminal system. So let's define what we mean by that. The trigeminal system is the trigeminal nerve, the upper cervical nerves, and the nucleus in the central nervous system that regulates them, okay? So let's break it down. The trigeminal nerve itself is the fifth cranial nerve emerging from the bottom of the brain, and it has a pair of ganglia that sit in the floor of the sphenoid bone, right here in the center of the head. It's kind of behind your eyeballs and about here, okay? Now, if we were to chop off a head, shunk, and then look in to the bottom of the cranial bowl, these two dots correspond with the location of the trigeminal ganglia. They are sitting in the middle cranial fossa, in the greater wing of the sphenoid, and from there they send projections anteriorly and inferiorly to innervate the front and the top half of the skull. Like so. The trigeminal one branch is called the ophthalmic nerve and it perforates through the sphenoid and then it courses along the upper orbit of the eye and then emerges over the eyebrow and flows over the forehead and the top of the head. That's the ophthalmic nerve and you can feel it yourself or its tunnel at least by finding the notch right here on uh, in the medial eye orbit and pressing into here should not be too painful, but if it's sensitized, that's your ophthalmic nerve right there. Boom, flowing up over the forehead on the way it innervates the frontal sinus. Trigeminal two, it uh, starts in the same place, perforates through the sphenoid and instead courses below the eyeball and then goes through the maxilla bone here. So it's called the maxillary nerve and it innervates the upper row of teeth, the maxillary sinus, and then if you see the flare of your nostrils and go lateral, you'll feel kind of a flat section of the maxilla. That's where the maxillary nerve emerges to the surface and innervates the skin here. Trigeminal three perforates through the floor of the sphenoid 
and then courses inferiorly. It's called the mandibular nerve on the whole. But before it gets too far, it splays out and emerges to the surface here, sending a projection back and also down like this. So that's trigeminal three. Right here, it also innervates the TMJ capsule and the muscles of mastication. And then it perforates into the jaw. Inside the bone, it courses anteriorly, innervating the bottom row of teeth and also emerging to the surface here and here as the mental nerve innervating the skin right here. So that's your basic trigeminal nerve, ophthalmic, maxillary, mandibular. Um, and there are also some secret branches of the trigeminal nerve which innervate the meninges covering the brain as well as the arteries perforating into the main compartment of the skull. Now there's a bit of a caveat there. It's innervating the meninges above the tentorium, which is this horizontal meningeal membrane here. Um, so think about the, the whole cerebrum, that's to say above the tentorium on the inside of the skull, as well as the face and the top of the head. That is the trigeminal nerve. Let's talk about the upper cervical nerves, C1 through C3. These nerve roots send projections anteriorly and also posteriorly um, to the back of the head. They also innervate the meninges, the dura below the tentorium. So when you think about occipital nerves in the back of the head, when you think about the innervation of this part of the neck, that's C1 through C3. Now, there's a familial relationship between C1 through C3 and the trigeminal nerve. They're really part of the same system. And we know this because the afferent branches, that's to say the inflowing sensory data that comes in through those sensory nerves, ends up in the same place. And that is a chunk of central nervous system in the brainstem that we call the trigeminal cervical nucleus. So this is the first place in the central nervous system that receives the incoming signal from the trigeminal nerve and the upper cervical nerves. And this is the first place where there's a real regulatory lever. It's the first place where the central nervous system can take in data around what kind of threat it might be perceiving, and it can drive changes to the sensitivity of this system. It can drive the experience of pain, it can drive inflammatory behavior, muscle tone, etc., throughout the trigeminal system. So, when you treat headaches, think of yourself as having a conversation with the trigeminal cervical nucleus. All of your attempts at treatment should be an attempt to speak its language, to understand its feedback in terms of pain experience, muscle tone, autonomic function, inflammation. Okay? So, how do you begin to learn its language? That's when you want to ask some questions of the body and of the person experiencing the pain. First of all, the simplest thing in the world but often gets missed. When somebody has head pain, ask them where and when. Locate the pain in time and space because this will be a clue as to whether or not this pain is a primary nociception, a referred pain, or whether it has systemic drivers. So what do I mean by primary nociception? I mean that one of these nerves and the tissue that it's innervating is irritated. And that is the simple reason for the pain. So you ask somebody, where is your head pain? And they say, ow. And then you or they put pressure on that ophthalmic nerve. And guess what? It reproduces the pain. That is what we call primary nociception. The tissue itself is irritated or inflamed and it is contributing a major component to the experience of pain. Great. Then it becomes a simple matter of getting this less irritated. Now there's another phenomenon that's very common, which is referred pain. For example, oftentimes somebody will say, I have pain here. And you push around here and it does not reproduce the pain. However, you push back here and all of a sudden they get the pain that they were complaining of. That is not primary nociception. That is an erroneous guess by the trigeminal cervical nucleus as to where the threat is. 
So it's getting an abundance of irritative input from the neck and it's projecting that discomfort into another region of the head. That's referred pain. And so you can begin to distinguish between the primary tissue being irritated or a referral pattern. And there's many examples of this. And then for many headaches, it's not quite that simple. There are other drivers of perception of threat that can sensitize the trigeminal system. You want to think about any other systemic drivers that might be contributing to the experience of pain. And this is where you want to ask the person about their life. You want to get them to have an inventory of triggers and resources. Okay? So triggers means any situation or stimulus which tends to upregulate the tendency for pain. Are there moments in your life or activities you do or stimuli you encounter which give you that familiar pain? Oftentimes people will know more than you think about what drives their pain, um, but they've kind of gotten used to it. So have them give you a full inventory of triggers and have them think actively about triggers they may not have identified. Chemo sensation, emotional stress, physical position, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it's also useful to ask about resources. Ask the person what contexts, what activities, what stimuli reduce the experience of pain or reduce the perception of threat in some part of their system. Oftentimes folks will know something that makes them feel strong, safe, and nourished. So if you want to help someone get better over time from headaches, you want to have them cognizant of their triggers and their resources so that they can make strategic decisions over time about how to reduce the one and improve the other. Maybe the driver of headache pain is that they hate their job. It's not a problem you can solve overnight, but to know it is the beginning of a solution, right? Great. So, head pain, think of it as an irritation to the trigeminal system, which includes the trigeminal nerve and the upper cervical nerves and the trigeminal cervical nucleus. Your job as a therapist is to try to calm down the present moment experience of discomfort by learning its language and get the person thinking strategically about the things that make headaches more or less likely over time and walk the path with them. So just because you're empowering them doesn't mean that you're abandoning them. Headaches are tough. Headaches are sometimes very persistent. Walk with them. Say, I'll be here to help you out. We have an appointment in two weeks, in three weeks, etc. We'll check in then and we will refine this strategy. That in and of itself, the fact that someone is willing to be a companion in the journey of reducing headache pain is worth almost anything else that you do. So make sure you communicate the willingness to walk the path of pain reduction with your patient. Okay, so those are my thoughts. It spans from the physiologic to the psychosocial but I hope it's a little bit helpful. And um, I personally find this an extremely useful way to break down headache pain. It's an irritation of the trigeminal system in response to a perceived threat. And it plays out across this landscape. Thank you for your time.